Some holdovers from the first segment include the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Good morning again, Rob. And very few people know this, but Mario Andretti had a son named Michael. And that man is sitting right here, Michael Andretti Heights. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Dude was racing Lamborghinis and Ferraris this time last week. And having a blast. Uh, and man. having a time of his life. Man. Yes. And stayed alive. What's the deal alive. if you wreck one? Money. <laughs> <laughs> no, no deal, just money. You signed a bunch of papers before, before it started? Uh, yeah, they give you a list of how much it costs if you wow. if you touch something else or go off the road or something. Yeah. So you're self-insured, so to speak. Um, up to a certain point, and then you, you purchase insurance uh, you know, as part of the whole package uh, to drive them. So if, if you total one, then that insurance kicks in. But there's, there's a deductible. Are there many accidents, Mike, that you talk no, about? No, I, they said not no, not very many. Because much, no. it sounds like it's yeah. fairly controlled. It is. Yeah. It's very controlled. All right. We are joined in studio by Alonzo Perry. Good morning, Alonzo. Good morning. He's Good in morning. the Mike Heights seat today. Uh, Mike, Mike Carl's seat, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mike Heights in the mic. Larry Schultz. Great to be here. Via telephone, my Pazan, Joseph Joey Torts for Ready. Good morning, everybody. Hey, how jealous are you of height driving Italian sports cars, Joe? Extremely. In fact, uh, when I get a chance, I'm going to talk to him about what he was able to do there and how, because I, I, that's something that would very much interest me. Do you like to drive fast, Joe? I don't have the kind of vehicles to do that, Mike. I have a truck, and uh, so I don't drive fast. But I would love to try it someday. I, I just those those cars are, are mean machines. They are phenomenal. You'd have a blast. Joe, do you remember that old movie, The uh, Gumball Rally? Oh, yeah. Michael yeah. Sarazin oh, was yeah. in that. Remember yeah. the uh, the guy that was driving the, uh, I think it was a Ferrari. He said, uh, the first rule of Italian racing. He rips off the rearview mirror and throws it away. <laughs> what is it behind <laughs> me is not important. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, uh, that movie was made sometime in the 70s. Yeah. Gumball Rally. Uh -huh. You don't see it too much on reruns or whatever. No. But it is out there. Yeah. I've always remembered that. Just to... Wanted to rip that rearview mirror off of a couple of times myself. All right. Hey, uh, this is a day that gave me a lot of choices regarding a theme, right? So this is National Nurses Week. This is the birthday of uh, Florence Nightingale. So uh, we could have gone with a nurse's theme. Uh, but I really couldn't figure out how to work out you five with a nurse's theme, so that went away. Mother's Day weekend. Born in Grafton, West Virginia. Could have gone with the Mother's Day theme. But I don't know what kind of relationship you guys have with your mothers. <laughs> I didn't really want to go there either. <laughs> it's, it's Yogi Berra's birthday. Now, we've done yogiisms before, but the, the hitch in that one was that Alonzo Perry had no idea who Yogi Berra was. Still doesn't know who Yogi Berra is. He still thinks it's the guy with the bear with no pants and a pick of casket. Yeah. Only it, you can prevent forest fires. Wrong oh, bear. <laughs> totally wrong bear. So I didn't want to uh, haunt Alonzo that way either. So instead... What I learned in discovering through history is that today is also the birthday of the man most closely associated with the limerick. Hmm. Didn't know that, did you? And who is that guy? Well, that's going to be coming up in oh, the intros, okay. well, no. Bill, right? So uh, we did limericks for St. Patrick's Day weekend, and we're going to do them again today. All right, so here we go. Is uh, I have to uh, find my word document. There we are. Okay, there we go. We start off with uh, oh, this fellow here to my right here. As we celebrate National Limerick Day, we welcome Larry Schultz, born in PA, who studied the law till fur grew from his jaw. And then Donald Trump came along and turned all that fur gray. <laughs> <laughs> Morning, Larry. Fair. Fair. Like in that insurance ad with ants, Title 42 expired. And this guy keeps thinking... How this Biden guy get hired? You see, Mike Heights all about law and order, especially along the Mexican border. So he waits for Trump to return to tell Biden, "You're fired." <laughs> oh, what a beautiful day! That Maybe not. <laughs> Our Facebook comment community thinks he can be scary. For his views to the right, he does marry. His response to them is they're woke. And you know who's got it back there is Eric O'Rourke. <laughs> so let's welcome back panelist Alonzo Perry. Absolutely. Shout out to Eric. How about Eric in the audience get the, uh, the rhyme there, Eric? Wow, Eric. I bring Joe Ferretti on, and I do this, and as I, as I do this, I do not jest. 
and each week he shows up and does his absolute best. His takes are quite pure, and the odds are, I'm sure, that he's safer than Bob Huggins as a guest. <laughs> <laughs> That's a low bar. <laughs> uh, that's a low bar. Uh, all right, here we go. That leaves only Mr. Stubblefield. Edward Lear was born the 12th of May. He popularized, popularized the limerick, now here to stay. 1812 was his birth year, we know. So, Bill Stubblefield, what we want to learn on this show is what was the weather like that day? <laughs> cloudy, cloudy. <laughs> cloudy and a chance of meatballs here. All right, we go on to uh, issue number one with our leadoff hitter, Joe, Joey Torts for ready. Well, Rob, in a, in, a, in a week or in a few days when we've learned that a Supreme Court justice and his wife are getting big money, we learned that the current president's family has been getting big money. We learned that the former president... Uh, was found to be responsible for a sexual abuse claim in a courtroom in New York City. And we had a sitting congressman indicted by the Justice Department all in the last week or so. Uh, I chose, and, and this is a wonderful transition by you, Rob, I chose to discuss the Bob Huggins situation that came up on Monday when our coach showed up on a Cincinnati sports talk show and proceeded to utter highly offensive slurs against the gay community and perhaps even Catholics, if you look uh, closely at what he said. And I got him a, a bunch of hot water over in Morgantown. And I'm curious as to how we should react to the ultimate decision made by WVU and its president, Gordon Gee, to not terminate Coach Huggins but to merely suspend him for three games, dock him a million dollars from his uh, contract, reform that contract so that it goes year to year now and it's not a multi-year contract, which is not insignificant, by the way, Uh, and to, I guess, uh, make sure that he attends sensitivity training uh, with regard to the gay community and the damage caused by – uttering such uh, nasty slurs. Is this a situation where the university handled it appropriately, or should the university have fired Coach Huggins for th- this uh, transgression that occurred just a few days ago? Joe, wh- when I circle back to you for a uh, final word, maybe you can give us your opinion on how you think it was handled as well. Oh, well, absolutely. I, I, well, I'll say right up front. I think... Uh, that the university, in my opinion, handled it in a fair manner. Uh, And I'll have some reasons for that. But uh, I I think too often we jump to conclusions and people should lose their job right away. And uh, in this particular instance, I think the university, uh, they gave me the impression they looked at it closely. I think that the sanctions against the coach are, are fairly severe. And uh, uh, so I think that they resisted what, Oftentimes we find out on Twitter and social media where everybody wants somebody's job immediately. I don't think that's always the appropriate response. And in this case, I think uh, the university uh, did handle it fairly. Uh, I could, they could be criticized for it. That, and we might hear that this morning. But uh, in my opinion, I think they did. All right. I was going to go to Mike Height for the first opinion here, but because something fell behind him, I have to actually go back behind him and fix that. So I can't have the camera showing Mike Height while I'm back there doing the, my hijinks. So my... It would be great to let his heart rate slow down a little bit before he has to talk to Yeah. So in, 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 the wall. instead, I'm going to go to the Admiral Bill Stubblefield for the first opinion on this. Billy. Uh, yeah, Joe. Uh, in today's time, I don't think it was nearly as shocking as what it would have been 15, 20 years or so ago. Unfortunately, and I'm and I'm putting quite a bit of the blame with our with President Trump. Uh, we've gotten so we accept these 
these very, I think, unfortunate statements that are, that's thrown out way, way too frequently. I, I cannot condone it. I cannot, uh, I cannot, uh, I think he was wrong in what he did. Uh, but we do have a different standard today. And we as a community, we as a nation have started viewing things different than what we did the other day. I, I agree with you. I think the university probably took the right step. I know one of some of the local talk shows, they kept saying, uh, uh, she, he should not be reprimanded. Nothing be done to him because he's our guy. He's our coach. Uh, but looking at it from a much broader perspective, I think the new university did, did, did just right. Michael Heights. So I, I think that you, you have to remember that when you are in um, these positions that he's in, that you represent the school, and there are certain um, standards of conduct and uh, that that you have to uphold and. Uh, he, he crossed the line. Uh, there have to be consequences for it because you do represent the school at that point. Um, what he said wasn't acceptable, um, and you can apologize all you want, but you have to know when you're in that position you can't say those types of things to begin with. Um, and so, you know, was was the punishment, did the punishment fit the crime? You know, that, that remains to be seen. Something had to happen. Uh, I, I applaud the school for doing something. Um, we can sit and debate uh, back and forth whether it went far enough or not. Some people will say it, it, it was enough. Some people will say it wasn't enough. Um, some people will say he shouldn't have done anything at all. He should have free speech. Um, but, but he does have free speech, but he is representing the school. So they have the opportunity to to censor him as well. So uh, I didn't have a problem with what the school did. I thought it was appropriate. And, um, you know, let's see if he learned uh, his lesson from that. Larry Schultz. I want to focus a little bit upon the apology that he made. Um, Don't know whether he wrote it himself or he had a little help. But so often we see these terrible apologies from public personas who who do something and they you know they'll even use a version of well that's not me oh yeah bob pretty sure it was and he did, he did not do any of that he was very straightforward the purpose of an apology in uh, uh, human social interaction is the rebuilding of trust and when you own what you said you admit what you said you say there is no excuse and I won't make any here, as he said. Um, And then we hear the next day that they took a million dollars of his money, and that million dollars is going to be donated to a group that will run the, um, let's say, the re-education of Bob uh, Huggins. Uh, And so that's going to be a a series of situations, as you look at it, where he's going to be face-to-face with people who... I have more right than anybody to be offended by what he said. Actually, so actually, it's three million dollars, a million dollars per year. Oh, so okay. So great. So now he's going to have to rebuild his trust with that community. They set it up. I think it's a great idea, so that he has to address those people um, again and again and again, and until they trust him again, not to do this sort of thing. It also bothers me. I don't know what time of day it was. It seemed like it was in the middle of the day. And it just seemed so completely beyond the pale that it made me wonder what he'd been doing earlier in the day. Um, (laughs) Was there alcohol involved? (laughs) Well, I wasn't going to use that term, but that was uh, certainly a question that occurred. You know, the unfortunate thing is, and you mentioned... uh, when people trust him again uh, and people in his position coaches in particular um, people trusting him again a lot of times is tied to wins and losses if he starts sure. losing a lot they're going to lose they're, they're, he won't regain the trust which is unfortunate that, that this has nothing to do with wins and losses but the trust will come with wins and losses yes so, go ahead I mean, it, you know I I it's it's weird watching this play out because we understand, I guess, you know, that you're you're in a job, and so with a job, you know, there's a certain responsibility to conduct yourself a certain way and uh, take care of, you know, how you're presented, especially in a form where you're speaking in the capacity of your position. So I, I don't think that the the punishment that was given was, you know, uh, 
I, I, I don't think it fit the crime necessarily, but I also don't think it was inappropriate as well, right? I think um, to fund this group, I think they're activists for LGBTQ and, you know, giving them millions of dollars. I mean, I think that that was the, the desired result in the end, just period. I don't think that that was, you know, to, to amend or make any, you know, uh, 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 any type of gesture of, of good faith towards, you know, people that may have actually been harmed by this, you know, uh, language and, and behavior. So uh, we're at a weird road where I think Freddie's actually right, where he says, you know, I don't know if this is... Uh, you sounded surprised when you had to admit that there, Alonzo. <laughs> well, yeah, no. It, I got That's him. what's weird about it. He <laughs> <laughs> almost choked on that yeah. word, Joe. Alonzo. <laughs> You need to enter politics. You're getting very good about going both sides. Well, well, it's it's because I think with this kind of situation, it it, it requires that. You know, uh, this is not something that is. Uh, this is about a couple of things. It's not just about you know what he said. This is also about you know what is our right to offend. What is a professional you know capacity and and how do you you know uh, act in that behavioral manner and you know. It, with that, you're navigating kind of this weird road. So uh, while I don't, you know, uh, necessarily agree with his statements and don't think that it was, you know, probably a smart, you know, way to be that comfortable on the radio and just blurt out what he did. Uh, I, I also I, I don't know if I'm a super big fan of the way that we're traversing, you know, uh, his punishment as well. So I, 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 I see when this broke, I saw this in, in a couple different lights, one of which was a generational light. Uh, so, mm -hmm. Mike, Larry, me, Bill were all born before the age of political correctness, right? And I'm going to guarantee you that all of us have, and Joe too, uh, have all come across words that were said in the 60s and 70s and 80s to describe people that, for the most part, didn't make people blink twice. Right. Right? Yep. And then as time went along, it became clear those words were not appropriate to use. Okay? So Huggins is very much old white guy. Okay? And uh, those words, I'm sure, 50 years ago on the playground or whatever, uh, flo you know, came, came out of his mouth just like they probably did for most people of our age at some point along the way. Until you were told, eventually, those are hurtful words that you really shouldn't use to talk about people. Okay? Uh, so I thought to myself, this is probably, if you had a drink or two, probably something that kind of slipped out. Shouldn't have, but probably slipped out. But then I thought to myself, but this is a guy of great responsibility here, okay? This is a guy that works on a college campus where it can't be more clear as you're surrounded by 20-somethings and late teens every single day. And while you're recruiting these kids, right? That this is not the words that they use. Not in the same manner that we might have used them 40 years ago or whatever. Okay? And you couldn't possibly be that tone deaf to know that you can't, as Bob Huggins, say that on a radio show. Right? Any longer. It just it, it blew my mind that he would let this slip. And then the second aspect of this that came to me was this. College basketball is very much when you're recruiting an African-American dominated sport. And so and then my second thought was, hmm, I wonder if those kids who he's recruiting are going, wait a second, if he uses that word, which you're not supposed to use to describe them, is he using that word to describe, another word to describe me? Can I, is, is this, wait a, I gotta think about this for a second. Because if if you're if that word's flowing out that easily on a radio show, does that other word come out too? I, uh, you when, know, do I, I think you need to think about that. <laughs> I think you're overanalyzing, Rob. That's I, what I do, though. Yeah, I'm exactly. a radio talk show host. I, I get paid over I cannot I believe it. one of those recruits are going to go down that thought process. Well, maybe their together. parents were. And and I think we also get offended by everything anymore. This generation, we do. in particular, is offended by everything. And and. It, 
you could pick a word. I, I'll pick the word socialist. I've been called a socialist here recently <laughs> a, a lot. And, and, um, and true socialists and are offended here, that you're being included well, with them. Yeah. I look at things. That's it's, the real it's, crime. It's the context. <laughs> it's the context of the world. Word. It's those people who call me a socialist and mean it in a derogatory uh, manner. I, that I'm offended by. I'm offended because of of the implication that they're trying to make. They're trying to make a derogatory statement towards me. Those who call me a socialist in jest, the word doesn't mean anything. I, I just chuckle when I, you know they call it. So it's all in, in whether or not how you're taking it, whether you should be offended. Was was his intention to offend somebody? Probably not. He had probably had no intention to offend somebody at mm -hmm. all. So. How you take it should be, all right, he didn't mean to offend me, should not have said the word, but he didn't mean to offend me. Should he? Should there be consequences? Yes. Should he learn from this? Yes. But should everybody be offended? Come on, let's, let's get a little thing. He, he know, was talking about the crosstown shootout between Cincinnati and Xavier, which is a Catholic university, mm -hmm. and he was the coach at Cincinnati. Yes. And I got the distinct feeling, nobody said this, but I got the distinct feeling that that was a fairly common uh, Cincinnati student, uh, you know, screaming from the stands thing that would happen during the rivalry. Sure. That's how the the most vehement uh, Cincinnati fans referred to the Xavier players and fans. And uh, it, 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 that doesn't really lessen the level of the crime. I would also say... Being a socialist is a choice of a particular set of beliefs. Whereas uh, what he was talking about, for most people, they don't believe that it's a choice, especially the people who, uh, um, under, you know, who do those things, who have that lifestyle. They don't think it's a choice. They think, this is what I have to well, do. This the, is what I am. This this particular category was thrown out by this co-host. It was a uh, Huggins was citing a situation that happened several years before when he was coach of Cincinnati, and it was the uh, the radio announcer that used the word transgender, and then right. that's what started everything. It was not a transgender comment on the part of Huggins. Mm -mm. Now this was about, I guess. There was something that was like there was rubber uh, penises, you know, yeah, yeah, being thrown out on the court. Thank you for bringing that uh, word to the show. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, hold on. Because Alonzo even, was looking for a graceful way around that. <laughs> <laughs> there was a uh, rubber yeah, appendage. Yeah, 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 better than Huggins. Yeah. <laughs> is, is there a way? Is there a way around it? <laughs> so, so, I mean, this is uh, even the derogatory term that he used, or uh, not, for lack of better words, of calling it. That was used in like Congress in the 90s. Like that's not this word is not like you know some. This is an attempt to to police thought and, and speech and you know and it's 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 sad because I know that it can be harmful to people, but I also don't think that you know we need to go down this road of finding ways to censorship and engage in cancel culture. And I actually kind of disagree with the panel here when they say that you know the younger generation is super sensitive. I think that's a minority. I think if you go and turn on like your Xbox and then you go and you know play like some Call of Duty online, you'll find out very quickly oh, that yeah. people don't you yeah. know. I uh, I agree with Lonzo. Bad. On this, I, I kind of disagree with the way you characterize. I'm of the generation where we do find this a very offensive, and I because we were the when I was growing up, the strongest word you ever heard was "damn" and "hell," and that was it. So then your generation was a little more inclusive of what was accepted, no, not no, less. No, your, your generation don't don't go be uh, don't be washing your hands on this one here, Pontius Pilate. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, don't give me that in the least. <laughs> when I, when I, where, where, where's he going, Larry? I might need a lawyer. Uh, you, you need a Catholic. That's what you need. <laughs> An exorcism. And some, and some blue molding. Yeah. So I, I was a Dago, a Wop, a Guinea, greasy Italian. I was the darkest kid in my school, so I was also the N-word, right? So... That that didn't get invented in 1963. Your generation had perfected it by the time I was born, bro. <laughs> uh, 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 in Tennessee, we didn't talk that way. And, and how I think you were below the Mason-Dixon line. <laughs> how offended were you when you were called those those words? Not in the least, because you know, I, 
it's just what everyone did back then. That, was you, you, that's how you referred to everybody. And, and I guess that's the point I was trying to make. If if somebody didn't mean it in a derogatory manner, then why would you they take offense in, to some it? Some people meant it in derogatory <laughs> manner. Sometimes, sure the they did. Did. Sometimes they didn't. But you know, so, if you're a German, you were a crowd. If you're if, a French, if I don't you're a frog, mean whatever. to offend you, don't be offended. As sort of, get some thicker skin. If, if I'm not trying to offend you, then don't be offended. Well, times have changed, though. Would, would Huggins, I mean, do you, does everyone here believe that Huggins would say that to someone to their face, though, too? You know, I mean, I, I, I don't I don't think that he's calling, like what Mike Height was saying, he's not calling anybody, you know, the name directly or, or in a manner that would be hostile or, or violent or to, you know, uh, bring a charge uh, to an individual. And, I mean, I think that that's part of what's socially acceptable, too, is, I mean, you have to take into account a, a multitude of factors. What's your tone? What's, who are you, you know, referring to? I mean, this seemed kind of playful. Was it immature? Was it not appropriate for his job capacity? Yes. But, I mean, we, we also have to take in these other variables and say, you know, are, are we as a society going to just, you know, uh, want to just... I don't know, shun these people to a dark corner of society when they say something wrong. I caution you to not take too big of a break between words in your sentences or Bill will utter penis again. On the <laughs> <program>. <laughs> Joe Ferretti, final word comes back to you. Well, when, when I first heard this, I, I thought, oh, he'd be gone. And there's precedent for that because there was a Fox Sports uh, announcer who was fired, a Rutgers basketball coach who was fired for uttering the same terms. Uh, but in this case... Um, I, I, it was a close call, but I came down on the side of WVU and how they handled it because the two most prominent advocacy groups in the state of West Virginia for the gay and lesbian community, Fairness West Virginia and the ACLU, basically signed off on this. They came out with their own statements. They, they certainly condemned what was said. They, they want to heighten awareness about the issue, but they were fine with this. And my thought was, if they're good with it, I'm good with it. And that's why I, I, again, close call, but I thought I'll side with WVU on this one. All right, Bill, you're on deck. we got to take our uh, top-of-the-hour break here a couple minutes after the hour. Jim Klein in the comment section said, nobody had the guts to mention that Huggins was 18 and 13 last year, but has the number one recruiting class. And if he didn't have that, he might not have survived the situation. I think that was alluded to in the conversation. Um, I don't. Nobody here was afraid to say that. Uh, honestly, that's not one of those things you're afraid of saying. Uh, I think that was ha- kind of hanging out there, but I don't think anybody finished the thought on that one, but that was definitely alluded to in the previous segment. So uh, Bill has an extreme close-up on his camera. <laughs> I don't right. know what happened yeah. during the time out there, but uh, we're about to find out if Bill has nostril hair at all. This <laughs> yeah. like, well, is close, baby. Yeah. And, and as luck would have it, you're on the clock yeah. With, yeah. The, with the first take. Colin has been here trying to fix it, but <laughs> to no, no avail. Yeah, uh, Rob, I was going to... Uh, play on President Trump's uh, CNN meeting on Wednesday and have some fun with that. But I'm going to do something more serious. Uh, Yesterday in Colorado, we had another mass shooting. Nobody heard about it because it becomes so common. A mass shooting is defined when um, four or more people have been injured, either killed or injured in a single outburst of violence. This year alone, we've had over 250 uh, mass shootings. Uh, we've had nearly 375 people injured, of which 100 or nearly 100 are children. That's a huge number. After every mass shooting, we hear two different groups come out and they say gun control or it's mental health. Most recently, um, uh, Governor Abbott said uh, we've... Uh, uh, it's it's a mental health issue, but it's the funny thing is Texas has invested less money on mental health than probably any other state. Uh, Abbott also said it is primarily, uh, or it's a lot in the uh, the so-called blue states. That prompted me to do some research. Uh, there are uh, uh, of the last since one January, thirty-eight states have had mass shootings. Fortunately, West Virginia is one of those twelve states that have not had. Of the 38, uh, uh, eight of them have had t- more than 10 mass shootings. California is among that list, but the of uh, the eight that's had more than uh, uh, 10 mass shootings, but the other seven are in so-called 
red states, uh, Florida, uh, Texas, Mississippi, Louisiana, North Carolina, Georgia, uh, uh, Pennsylvania is one, Tennessee is another one, Pennsylvania is not the red state, but the others are so-called red states. The states where they have more lax, uh, uh, lax gun control. But the argument has always been used, do mental health. My question today is, what, how do we address the mental health problem? It is a very easy throwaway term. We're going to take care of it in mental health. Uh, the sheriff was on the other day. We asked this question. We very quickly resorted to the definition of mental health. To me, that's not the issue. The issue is how do we address this? How do we recognize the individuals that may be a risk? It's very easy to do it in hindsight exceptionally hard to do in foresight because if you look at the uh, the one just since one january there's individuals domestic violence individual lost the job individual that has some ideology uh individuals that uh, do not like jews uh individuals that have uh, uh that's uh custody dispute uh bullying whole bit there's a lot of reasons if we tried to go through and identify these potential individuals, uh, we don't have the manpower. If we did have, it would be, Big Brother be watching. Uh, with everything we do, somebody would be there trying to pick up uh, what's going to be an indicator of an individual that might engage in mass shootings. Uh, my question to my colleagues is that, Let's get away with just the fact of this large umbrella of mental health. Pacifics, Pacifics, how can you address the mental health to avoid mass shootings, realizing that we do not want to go in a big brother's watching world and we do not have resources that we can put everybody that exhibits a little bit of a, a tendencies under some sort of medical care. We don't have the money for that. Nobody's doing that. The question is, is mental health something can be realistically addressed or is it a dodge for doing something else? And the whole thing plays on red flag laws a little bit, too, in some form or fashion, or at least approaching those as well. Let's start first with Alonzo Perry. Well, I, you know, uh, this issue is all about people control. This isn't about, you know, gun control. This isn't, you know, it, it, I understand why uh, we're saying that this is a mental health issue and we have to, you know, find a way to, to navigate it. Uh, that's important, uh, not only for uh, society as a whole, but, you know, also for the individuals that are experiencing the fallout of losing their loved ones and everything from this. So this is a really hard topic. But when we get down to, to, to the finite details, we need to start looking at the profile and, and what are the contributing factors towards people that are taking this um, this giant leap to, to violence. You know, it, there's much to say about a society where you have individuals that uh, for their ideological reasons, want to go and shoot children. I mean, I, I, I don't know what type of belief set, what type of, of profile would make you even, you know, contemplate such a, a, a nasty thing. And, and that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about normal, everyday people that we can send them to a uh, just a normal facility, uh, have them checked out for 72 hours, evaluate them. I mean, that stuff, it, it really doesn't work for everyone. That works for people that maybe, you know, have taken a, a, a wrong step and, and probably just need, you know, to, to reconcile themselves and come back into the workforce or back in their family life and uh, so forth. What we're talking about is people that are, uh, I mean, engaged in terrorism, I mean, of, of the worst propensity. And so what do we need to do? I don't know if we need to, you know, uh, bring back the asylums that we used to have back in the day, you know, where uh, th there are people that are committing heinous acts or, or are leading down this trajectory towards this, that uh, there's some type of reform. I, I really don't know what the right answer is. I just believe that, you know, it, it, we can't say mental health is a dodge or it's it's dismissive of what's. Um, the issue is it's it's the prime and, and single factor and we can dance around that idea to figure out what we need to do but uh, for the most part this isn't a, 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 an issue where we need to isolate an inanimate object like a firearm Larry Schultz um, 
one thing we leave out of this all the time, partly because the governors like Mr. Abbott, who talk about it, are uh, uh, they share something with mass shooters, is that this is virtually all men. I just looked up a statistic on Google in 2023 uh, of 140 shootings since April <laughs> um, of 23 or during April of 23, um, four were females, 136 were men. Mm-hmm. We never, I don't know about you, but I have never heard one of the people talking about the mental health issue further confine it to men's mental health (laughs) you know um that's a that's a really big and important issue for us to face and we're not even talking about it in those terms we just say oh well gun control mental health gun control mental health how about both and how about narrowing down the mental health problem by taking half the population almost half the pop well more than half the population out of it we need to focus on why men do this and and you know for those who know me um i spend a lot of time talking to men about why they choose violence as opposed to other means like apology (laughs) uh to resolve and rebuild trust with others and uh, it always fascinates me that when a public official talks about this, they never point out, yeah, another mass shooting, another guy did it. It's not women doing this. It's men. And there's some clue there. There has to be. And so, um, I, I, you know, I'm a, I don't think you can either treat mental health or control the access of guns. Uh, You've got to do both. You have to do both. And so the people who come in and say, we got to have more better gun control are just as wrong as the people say, no, the answer is mental health. It's both. And you can reduce the mental health side of it by focusing on the men first because they are 90% plus of the problem. So we've got to address both things. We have to have some sort of early warning system uh, that shows um, you know, you always hear people say the people who knew the shooter, well, yeah, he was a very troubled child and, and, you know, he was a, a troubled young man and we knew there were problems. We need to have a mechanism in place where we can take those kids regarding whom we know there are problems and find a way for them not to have assault rifles. I think that would limit the problem till still to, uh, a very difficult problem, but it would take a big chunk off the top if we focus on those two things. School guidance counselors and the kids' friends and teachers know who the kids are who are really troubled. They may not know that they're about to become a mass shooter, but they know who's really troubled. And if we could start there by denying them access to assault rifles, I think we might gain a big jump on this right at the beginning. It sounds like a red flag law to me, Mike Height. Well, I'm going to start by saying I'm going to push back a little bit on, on Bill's analysis. Um, when you, you stated states, I would much rather see the statistics based on cities because within red states, there are blue-controlled st- cities. So are they blue-controlled cities where these are happened or red-controlled cities within red states? So I would much rather see it narrowed down even even more than than the statistics you gave i I can find that i believe me mike they're all uh, red control cities as within red control states all red controlled cities yes okay yes so and and the other thing is larry you come from a a very unique situation you're a a lawyer and somebody who deals with violent individuals uh, on a regular basis so i would i would look to you for solutions and what you've given me here and just this brief uh interlude here is is very broad solutions we need to do something well that's what we all say we need to do something so i would i would look to somebody in your position to give me specifics what do we need to do what when you say we need to do both we need to address the the mental health issues of men who are violent 
how do we address them and what do we do and when you say we need to have gun control in what manner and to what degree and at the same time how do we do these things without violating an individual's constitutional rights okay for example one of the things the constitution says nothing about is 18 year olds older um owning um one shot a second or faster rifles because you know when the constitution was written you had a muzzle loader and it took you a minute between shots so one of the things very simple one of the very simple things no it's not irrelevant to the those masses of kids who get shot in two minutes before the cops can even get there but that's Um, not why the second amendment was written the second amendment at the time when the muzzle loaders they were the -the state-of-the-art weapon of war at that particular time well but the state we've had this discussion before the -the state-of-the-art weapon of war now is a nuclear weapon and are we going to give those to 18 year old kids with troubled pasts no we're not we're not going to do that that constitutional provision doesn't even remotely suggest that we would we would uh, have to do that so you can limit the rights of 18 year olds um i think you'd find that there's a fairly strong correlation uh, between youth and these behaviors. I don't remember seeing anybody 80 years old doing a mass shooting. Maybe there's been some, but it's young men, um, and and you need to have some background checks. Whether they, your they const- do. Let me, let me, uh, there's we a- don't have universal background checks at all. Let let me go in here because we're we're talking about guns again, and I, I really do want to talk about mental health because the mental hygiene portion of uh, what we have in place right now it doesn't work, right? So let me guys give you an example. I used to be a security officer at the hospital, and I remember I used to work in our psych ward, and I would go up there sometimes, and uh, the different confrontations and situations that I would run into sometimes, I used to wonder, how do these people navigate the world when they're not, you know, in here? And they're only here for sometimes three days, and then there's no facility to transfer them to. And then, not only that, but I would, uh, one example in particular, it always perturbed me. We had a guy that was in there, and he was just punching people. And he wouldn't stop just it just relentlessly he would walk by people you know go get a carton of milk and put somebody he would go walk into you know we put him in a room and uh with padding everywhere and stuff and it, it became to the point where we decided that we couldn't provide care for him so where did he go we released him on the streets and we're like i, I told him i was like guy you're gonna punch somebody right downtown which brought you in here that's the reason why you're here today and one of those people are going to show you something you don't ever want to see, you know? And and it, it was hard, you know, because you have to realize that these people uh, or, or there are people that seriously need to not be out in society and, 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 and doing things. But it's not so much that the processes of red flag in itself are damaging to you know uh, just people that have severe deficiencies it's damaging to law-abiding citizens it it takes their rights that you know are unnecessarily uh doing so that's not the good trade-off that i mean this is a balancing act this is about security and this is about liberty and i don't think that you know when we're talking about mental health it has anything to do with a gun there are people that have a mentality or or things that need serious treatment and we're not taking it seriously joe ferretti before we run out of time well i I agree we're not taking it seriously alonzo uh in fact i i deal with people who suffer from ptsd and it takes them in our community six months to get an appointment with a psychologist to or a psychiatrist for, for help, six months. Uh, we don't have the resources, we don't have the money spent and invested to help with mental health. And it, But the other side of the equation is this, there has to be an acceptance uh, that our rights enumerated in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights are not without their limits. We've experience has shown us that when people p- assemble which is expressly written into the Constitution in the First Amendment, the right to assembly. When people get together, sometimes violence ensues. So what do you have to do? If you want to have a parade or or a gathering in the city of Martinsburg, you better have a permit. Now, we readily accept that limit on the right to assemble. 
So we have to also accept that there has to be some limitations in terms of gun ownership. We, you know, you can't have an automatic weapon. Uh, yet uh, we, we still hear the arguments that we, you know, this is inviolate and we can't have any restrictions on and on gun ownership. And in fact, all legislative actions across the country pretty much are geared towards liberating even more the gun ownership rules that we abide by. So I think there has to be an acceptance on both sides of this equation. There has to be more investment and more paying attention to the mental health aspects of this country. And also we have to understand that all rights have limits. Bill, back to you for the final word. Yeah, uh, and I deliberately stayed away from the gun aspect or the red flag laws. Uh, the point I was trying to make, and I think is emphasized here, is the the shooters is such a diverse group of folks, and they extend beyond the young male. There's uh, quite a bit beyond the young male. Uh, it, the, it's so diverse, I don't see how it's physically possible to develop profiles that would work if we did develop profiles that work we don't have the resources to address these profiles uh, i'm coming to the conclusion even though mental health is important a whole bunch of issues it's not going to be the solution by itself for our mass shootings gentlemen we will take our break here and be right back with issue number three and for that mike height you are on the clock Steve Winwood's 75th birthday is today. Still with us, uh, by the way. Remember when I have had a habit of killing off artists in the past on this program who are actually still alive? <laughs> I did check. He is still alive. So Steve Winwood, 75. Happy birthday. Issue number three, we go to Delegate Michael Height. All right, I'll get right to it. Uh, with, with Title 42 set to expire and the impending surge of illegal aliens across the, the southern border, does this imply ineptitude on behalf of this administration, or is this what they wanted all really all, all along? All right, Alonzo, you go first. Well, I think that this, you know, definitely um, is something that they intended to happen. Um, you can't judge a policy by uh, what its intentions are. You have to judge it by its result. You know, and when you judge it by its result, you have to believe that that result is intentional. So uh, I think that they're trying to fundamentally reshape society. You know, uh, they look at the border issue and while Republicans are saying, you know, uh, these are people that, you know, are, are going through hard times. They're having uh, issues and they're coming over here and we need to make sure that they're vetted and properly integrated to become legal citizens and not just residents of this country. And the other side is saying, I have a big pool of voters that are, you know, pushing across the border. and. Uh, that's their their fundamental reasoning behind it, you know. So um, I do think it is absolutely intentional. Mr. Ferretti by telephone. Well, I I seem to remember the law of unintended consequences that we talk about all the time, uh, and you know the the sunsetting of Title Forty Two. I, I don't hear anybody debating whether that should actually happen or not, and of course there will be no debate because. Uh, the Republicans don't want to continue with COVID emergencies, God forbid, in this country. So, uh, you know, that law is sunsetting. And, and I think it's only natural that there's going to be reaction from those south of the border all the way down through Latin America who want to try to get to this country. And because now they know that automatic deportation under Title 42 does no longer exist. However, the Biden administration just announced this morning that if you are caught illegally in this country, you will be sent back and you will be barred from ever applying for asylum uh, or any other kind of status that would allow you to stay in this country for a period of five years. They have uh, mobilized the military to go down there and help secure the border. So I think they have rightly anticipated what might be an, uh, an uptick in people showing up at the border trying to cross. Now, right now, I, I don't – it's interesting. The news reports this morning don't show uh, a major influx of people. It's increased, but not to the degree that everybody feared. But I, I don't think that the Biden administration would intend to or want to invite chaos at the border, cause we, which would only heighten the problem for them politically. I, I, I just can't believe that that would be a rational thought on their part. But I, I do know that they need to 
push very hard with Congress to get a solution. We don't seem to be working on that solution right now, and I think it's incumbent upon all of them, Congress and the executive, to get something done. Billy? Yeah, I think the real uh, crime here is the inability, unwillingness of Congress to address and solve the immigration issue. And that ex- has extended over several administrations, several congressional sessions. That was remarkably concise. <laughs> well, you, I was chastised <laughs> off air. <laughs> I, I feel like I, I feel like like Fred Gwynn and my cousin Vinny when Joe Pesci made a very lucid objection and <laughs> surprised the judge on that one. <laughs> Larry Schultz. Um, last I checked. The Republicans control the House. Did they pass a bill yeah. to reinstate uh, 42? Did the Republicans on the uh, Senate side work to get the usual people that we know often will vote with them to move over and get this done? I never heard anything about a real push in Congress to replace 42. And the bottom line is 42 was a COVID measure. Um, and I don't think long term it's going to work any better uh, than some of the other solutions our government from both parties has tried. Um, we're going to have to face that people, as long as they're born with feet, are going to be walking toward this country. Um, the chance of a good life in the United States of America is much, much greater than the chance of a good life in Venezuela. Um, you know, we, a lot of people think that the vast majority of these folks are from Mexico. They're not, they're just walking through. They, they had a and, couple and, this morning on CBS news that walked from Ecuador to wow. the border. But these guys <laughs> walked. The house did pass a bill. They, they passed a bill relating to border security. And I also want to push back on what Freddie had said, because, uh, the, in the spending bill that the Democrats passed, they dealt with border security, Right. They didn't put any money in the actual security of the border, but they put money into the processing of people coming over here. So, well, uh, go ahead. But you have a legal right to come to this country and apply for asylum. The, every person who's crossing that border is not an illegal alien. They get to a place where they can apply for asylum. That's protected by the law. And, and so... That's the first problem. One of the things the Biden administration is starting to do is to move those selection uh, places down into Mexico and even into Venezuela and Guatemala and some of the other um, um, countries where people are coming from. Um, They're trying to move that choice about whether you're entitled to refugee status, whether you're entitled to uh, those things under American law, gather the evidence before they come here. And I think that's a great idea. That is actually the idea of a long-term solution to deal with the question. We do have laws in this country, whether you like it or not, that if your government is terribly abusing you, you can leave and come to the United States. You don't have to apply for a passport, which that abusive government won't give you. You can walk to the U.S., And you're not an illegal alien on the day you arrive. On the day they say you don't fit the, you don't fit the profile. See you later. Then you might become an illegal alien if you stay. But it's not as simple as people say. Well, these, you know, these uh, Spanish people are coming up through Mexico and they're and they're invading our country. A lot of them have a legal right to apply for asylum. And what are the conditions of asylum? Well, I'm not an expert on immigration law, but changing the dialogue from everyone's an illegal alien to some of these people are here because American law, U.S. law, permits them to come here and apply for asylum. And that, that makes it a little different. Look, I, people are paying attention to geopolitical issues, and uh, you have people on uh, TikTok and everything else, coyotes, you know, people that... that are trafficking people uh, are they know that this thing is expiring and so they're telling people you know we're, we're creating all kinds of conditions to bring you all through the country and not only that but to have them do forced labor and uh other just egregious crimes and so uh, while there's a, a legal process that people can do to apply for asylum i don't think a lot of it 
a lot of the people that are coming there, you know, uh, they they see that more as a mechanism, right? They're they're taking advantage of uh, the system that's in place to you know uh, benefit them, and and with the expiring of this and no inconclusive action as if we didn't you know talk about this for months and months on months on end to come to you know some type of compromise or some way to do this in a strategic way you have to say you know uh, that they you know uh, wanted this to happen and so there I, I don't know joe ferretti before i go back to my kite anything no i i did comment already rob yeah i didn't know if you had anything to circle back on or not Nope. Mr. Height. Uh Yeah, I sort of agree with Alonzo. I think this is um, this is has been the the Democratic long game for a long time. This is how you get more voters. the The vast majority of these individuals, when they get voting rights, vote blue. Um, so I, I think they see this as a way to enhance their their voting numbers, and uh, the, you know. They, they don't really see a problem with this. Um, I also think it's a little bit inept uh, uh, by this administration. I think this the whole border situation has been a debacle since this administration took over. Um, we had uh, we had executive orders in place that addressed this, and they were lifted almost immediately. Um, if we had just stuck with those, uh, the people would not be coming over in the the numbers that they're coming over that that stay in mexico until you've you've had your uh, your um your hearing um to determine whether or not that you you fit that criteria for asylum or not um was working um and i think they they've sort of blown this whole thing so uh, i think it's a, a combination of both issue number four we go to larry schultz yeah, given Trump's performance in his video deposition wherein he mistook his accuser, Ms. Carroll, for his wife, and given his performance at the town hall Wednesday night, uh, Tuesday night on CNN, how can any rational person believe uh, that he is competent to serve as president and representative of our country? I bring this up because I've spent 37 years practicing law. And um, many, many, many of those days have been spent preparing for depositions of various witnesses. When you sit down with a witness to prepare them to have their deposition taken, you can't tell them what to say. For one thing, you weren't there. Um, They can testify as they will. But one of the things you tell them is, don't answer when there's not a question. In Trump's video deposition, he's handed a picture of four people, and he immediately looks at it and says, well, that's Marla. (laughs) Well, as it turned out, it wasn't Marla, his wife. It was E. Jean Carroll, the woman who was accusing him of sexual assault, whom he said was not his type. I never in my life have seen, in all the years I've practiced, a more seminal moment in a deposition than that one. The case was over. (laughs) The case is over. You can't say she's not my type and mistake her for your wife. You just, you know, a wife you chose after you were already married uh, to somebody else. So it, what I'm saying is I, I've trained up a lot of people with very little education and, and no public speaking skills. And I never saw one of my clients make that kind of a mistake because you tell them, wait for the question. And they weren't going to say, isn't that Marla? <laughs> he, he gave it away. If he's that, I don't know, impressed with the sound of his own voice that he can't wait for a question. And the second one is this. Uh, during the CNN town hall, he made a very big point of saying on a couple of occasions that Putin made a terrible mistake by going into Ukraine. That struck me as odd, and I did a little background research, and I found a videotape of him saying, right after Putin invaded Ukraine, he's a genius. <laughs> he didn't. Okay, he's saying two very opposite things about the same event, and he didn't bother to say, I know, I know, I used to say he was a genius, but he made a terrible mistake. I, even a genius can do that. He didn't even bother filling that in, as though the rest of us are so ignorant, we couldn't remember back a year and a half. This is not a person that you want representing you. 
in negotiations with foreign governments. I understand the, the, the difficulty of a lot of Republicans who say, well, he's the only guy we got in the primaries who's going to have a chance. Well, okay, but I can't believe... Uh, what's your question you, here? What's your question well, here? How can any <laughs> rational person say... Even Bill's should, getting anxious over there. <laughs> how can any rational person say he, this man, limited as he is, should be our president? All right, Bill, you go first. Yeah, well, the town hall was theater. Uh, the Republicans are having much more consternation over it than the, uh, than the Democrats. Uh, yeah, he he's... Well, it shows Trump, Trump. It's going to probably help him with his base, but it's not going to do anything at all with the outside of his very hard over base. Mr. Ferretti. What is profoundly stupid about the defense that she wasn't his type is that it's implicit that there are women who are his type that he can sexually abuse. Mm. I, I can't. I cannot imagine any lawyer working with this guy in defense of any claim and i stand corrected from last week when i said this interview with cnn will probably amount to nothing because he'll probably defer and say i'm not going to say anything about this because it's pending investigation as i was corrected last week he came on the national television and spouted off about a number of things that could get him into legal hot water he is out of control he is uncoachable. He has no discipline personally. And uh, to answer your question, Larry, he should be nowhere near the presidency. End of story. Joe, how do you really feel? <laughs> <laughs> Mike Height. Um, Donald Trump. Um, so I'll, I'll start by saying the, the, the CNN town hall um, – there, there was no consternation on the part of Republicans. The consternation was on the part of the Democrats. He owned that town hall. And, and CNN, who had 90 minutes allotted for that town hall, shut it down after 70 minutes. There's a reason they shut it down after 70 minutes. He was owning them. And if, if you are not, and I am no Trump fan. So if there's consternation on the part of Republicans, it's people like me because he owned the day during that town hall. And now people like myself are concerned. You just opened the door for him to be the, the presidential nominee, bar none. Did you hear the Republicans the next day, the ones on the Senate especially that were interviewed? Everyone expressed uh, consternation. Yeah, on, on the Senate. So on the Senate side. I'm talking about the people that are going to vote for him. Mm -hmm. He owned the day. And if there's, if there's anybody that's worried, it's, it's the blue side. The Democrats did not like what happened. They're coming back at CNN right now. People within CNN are coming back at him saying, you gave this man a platform. What he said is irrelevant. And when you want to go back to the issue with, with his personal matters, you know what? I am offended by those personal matters but if i've learned anything is i learned in the 90s during the clinton administration just doesn't matter mm. that's what the blue side taught me just doesn't matter those are personal issues and that's not to be discussed well here we are on the other side so is it is it fair for my guy but not for your guy you know either they matter or they don't matter one or the other, you don't get to pick sides depending on who's in office. My personal opinion, yeah, they matter. Clinton should have been out of office. This guy should never, never be president again. I don't like either one of them. All right, However, I, 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 I got to get Alonzo in here, too. By the way, when you said so and you paused and look at Larry, they're going to say so, suck it. I thought that's what you were going next. <laughs> <laughs> that one there, I swear, that's what I thought you were going to say next. That, I would love to see That would be Joe Biden. sort of hugging. hugging, hugging there. There. Yeah. Alonzo. I would love to see Joe Biden's uh, deposition from the Tara Reid, you know, accusation. And I know you guys would not say anything about how he would navigate um, – that interaction i mean he has never been hard pressed on any of his sexual abuse allegations we just kind of tuck that under the rug and completely dismiss it from a longtime democrat that used to work in his uh administration used to work with him in the senate and if you haven't heard of tara reed that's you know the mainstream media is doing its job um now 
if we're going to the disposition, I think Mike Heitz right. Democrats have caught uh, a lot of glass in the face with this, and you know they're doing so because of the way that they're reacting on these news channels, the way that they're, I mean, they do not want to have debate. They do not want to have a conversation about things because they know that they're going to lose on the national stage. And I think something happened. I don't think the people in that this those stands were uh, Trump supporters, per se. I think that they were people that were watching uh, justice being, you know, uh, just stripped from that conversation, watching uh, the ability. I mean, there's a psychological aspect here of people that, you know, can see when someone's being targeted, when they're being bullied, when they're being abused. And I think that that's what took place at the thing. And that's why, you know, they started to support him because it was that underdog, you know. And so I, 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 I'm a Trump supporter. I hope that, you know, he goes a long way. And I do want to see him uh, take the presidency in 2024. The town hall reminded me a bit of when they asked OJ to try on the gloves, right? Yeah. <laughs> it was not the outcome that they wanted. Alonzo, uh, speed round for issue number five. Oh, um, so uh, I want to kind of get more on a serious topic again. Um, but what can law enforcement do to improve relations with communities to combat like anti-police sentiment? So recently um, there was another event in Martinsburg. Uh, I know we, we've talked about the middle finger to, uh, you know, the situation where that guy was pulled over, but there was also uh, apparently a death of a girl named Morgan Buzzard. And I don't know what the details of it yet are. I don't know if there was any kind of misconduct that, uh, uh, but it was a fight that had broke out at Anthony's Pizza, and then she had passed away at the hospital here in WV Medicine. So I was just wondering, what do you guys uh, want to do, or what do you think we need to do to combat anti-police sentiment just in our community? Because this stuff got like 400 shares. I'll give you about 45 seconds apiece and start with you on the phone. Joe Ferretti. Uh, transparency. It, it, they have to address each issue as it arises and in the most transparent way possible. If there's videos, can't, body cams, and things of that nature, if there are reports, uh, to the extent they can with pending investigations, they have to be public with that information. These guys are public servants, uh, from the chief of police all the way down to the, the, the lowliest corporal on the, on the police force. And so they really need to have a better community uh, outreach and, and provide the information each instance where their policing is called into question. Billy? Yeah, I think the uh, chief of uh, police from Martinsburg is doing a marvelous job as far as reaching out, trying to explain, trying to embrace the public. You're going to find situations arise uh, all the time, but I think we're doing a lot locally trying to engage with the public. Larry? Um, I agree with Joe. Uh, they have to be as transparent as possible in bringing forth to people the answers about why these bad things happen and uh, quickly as they can. Mr. Height? Uh, I'll agree with the transparency uh, part of, of the answer, um, but I also like um, what I'm seeing with Martinsburg Police and the Sheriff's Department where they are, are, are starting to go out into the community and saying to their their uh, officers you need to go out and be part of the public you need to be on foot you need to meet with people you need to befriend them you need to be part of the community and and so these people know who you are not just when something's going bad but they you become a regular face to them and that needs to happen there also needs to be an education of the public of the how difficult the situation is their job is and what they're faced with on a regular basis when they are called they are very defensive from the get-go. They, they never know what is going to happen, and you have put them in a very bad situation. I'm not making excuses for anybody's conduct, but you, the public also needs to understand from their perspective what's going on when they're called to a situation. Alonzo, back to you. Yeah, I, it, it's super hard of a conversation, but I was heartbroken when I was listening to Sheriff Harmon talk about, you know, um, when he was interacting with people at the school, you know, just watching kids get on the bus and stuff and making sure they're good and people being like, what's going on? What's what's wrong? You know, uh, or not wanting to drop their kids off because the, the side of the police. Um, I think that, you know, it, this problem needs to be somehow, you know, uh, fixed in schools. I, I, is there a way to put a class in or a course or something that, you know, uh, shows people, you know, that or teaches them, you know, how how traffic stops work? What's, you know, going on in our criminal justice system? I mean, just a, a like 
not a, a full range thing, but something that, that just, you know, creates a more positive interaction because I don't think people realize how quick or something can go sideways, you know, or, or even have any clue of what these guys have to deal with in law enforcement. And so I'm just, you know, uh, blown away and, and really trying to think, you know, how can we fix this? Because it, it, this is nationwide and it's really hemorrhaging. Um, the the ability for law enforcement to function and it's uh, also i think contributing to even issues like our prison dilemma you know where there's a culture around that job that people are no longer interested in uh getting into all right gentlemen thank you very much we're going to do uh, final thoughts coming up with our last minute here you'll get uh, eight seconds apiece as always spend them wisely or you can pass some of your seconds along to the person beside you if you like there's no charge for that Final thoughts. We begin via telephone with Joe. Joey Torts for Ready. Go, Joe. Sadly for us, Rob, Pittsburgh Pirates are who we thought they were. <laughs> <laughs> not as good as they we thought you they were. you got to scream that when you say it. Yeah. Larry Schultz. Um, when Donald Trump called the interrogator from um, um, CNN nasty, he forgot perhaps that almost all of our presidential elections are decided by suburban women. Bill Stubblefield. Give the mothers in your life a big hug on Mother's Day. Alonzo. Uh, on June 21st, join the Berkeley County Republican Club at Mountain Meat Smokers for political trivia night. Mike, you have no time left. Sorry. <laughs> this is Tom. You've jumped on our Martinsburg at TV 10. Go talk to get at 70. Short hours.